Well, hello and welcome to our next edition of the Badger Crop Connect uh, webinar of our 2023 growing season. I'm your host today, Jerry Clark. I'm an agricultural educator, regional educator covering Chippewa, Dunn, and Eau Claire counties. Um, the Badger Crop Connect series aims to provide timely crop updates for producers and uh, agricultural professionals in Wisconsin throughout the growing season. Uh, the program is jointly sponsored by the UW Division, UW Madison Division of Extension, the Crops and Soils Program, and the UW Madison Nutrient and Pest Management Program. Um, when you registered, you did re, um, were asked uh, about uh, demographic information, and as a recipient of federal funding, we are required uh, to collect that information regarding our outreach efforts. Um, so again, thank you for um, filling out those demographic information as that helps us with our uh, future programming. So while many of you are familiar with our Zoom technology as we've been at this for a while, uh, just a couple things to kind of go over quickly. If you can keep your microphones muted and uh, videos off, that can help uh, those with uh, slower internet connections able to uh, participate in the program a little bit cleaner and, and more uh, productive that way. Um, also, feel free to use the chat box to type your questions in for our presenters. Uh, you can enter those at any time throughout the program. Um, and then at the end of each session, we will uh, ask for questions if you want to uh, open up your microphone at that point. Uh, we'll try to uh, provide as much time as we can to answer questions that you have. Um, if you have trouble with the uh, Zoom technology today, uh, Sam Bibby is our Wrangler today. Sam is down in the Vernon Sock Juno area. So thanks, Sam, for helping with some of the technical issues today. And there again, um, he'll put that information in the chat box for you. Um, so with that, uh, we will move on to our uh, program today. I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, welcome uh, Dr. Rodrigo Worley. He's our weed science specialist uh, with UW-Madison Agronomy Department. We also have Nick Arneson, uh, as a, uh, assistant uh, at the, in the agronomy department. I see Nick in the background there. And we also have Josiah Nunes that's going to help provide program uh, coverage today. So uh, with that, uh, Rodrigo, if you want to share your screen and uh, we'll kick off the program. Thank you, Jerry. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, nice day out there. We we're just talking about it. Wish we, you know, as soon as we're done with the seminar here, we'll probably get out there and, you know, get some of the, the field activities uh, rolling. So uh, we're excited to be here today, uh, we're going to have three presenters. Uh, Nick and I are going to kind of recap uh, the main topics we discussed during our extension season here over the past four or five months. And then we're excited to bring our PhD student, Jose Nunes. Uh, Jose is the one that's leading our planting green efforts. And today he's going to be sharing, uh, you know, the, the main learnings uh, from the project. So we're excited that Jose gets to be here and talk about that project. Uh, with you all. Before I start sharing my screen and I pa pass the mic uh, to Nick, there's just a few things that I want to cover. Uh, well, you know, when I get asked the same question multiple times in a matter of a couple of days, I always think that's pertinent information to bring back to you all. So the first one that I've been getting a lot is whether uh, warrant herbicide, okay, encapsulated acetylchlor can be used pre- I had a corn and the answer to that is no. Okay, so warrant herbicide is not labeled for pre-emergence application in corn in Wisconsin. Okay, it's, it's okay in soybeans, but warrant cannot be used pre in corn. It can be used post-emergence. Okay, so that's just one thing I wanted to share. The other question that I'm getting a lot is in scenarios where we have mixes of cover crops or no-till, uh, the use of 2,4-D ahead of corn. Okay, so just uh, remind folks out there that if you're spraying half a pound acid equivalent or equivalent of pine product, there is a seven day interval between application and planting, and that's to reduce the chance for crop injury. There also, there's also seven day for soybeans. If you don't have, if you have non endless soybeans, you gotta wait a seven day period there between spraying uh, and planting. And if you do have endless soybeans, by the label within a seven day interval pre-plant, then you cannot use an acid or amine product. You gotta use the enlist 
one, okay? So just uh, things to be mindful of. So the first one is a warrant application ahead of corn. That's a no-no. And then that period uh, from a 240D application ahead of corn and uh, soybeans. And then the last one that's coming up is for folks that are going to harvest soybeans uh, this fall and plant uh, winter wheat. Just take a look uh, at the plant back intervals for some of the residual herbicides, particularly the herbicides that contain group two or ALS chemistry. Okay, there is a window there that you got to wait. So if you're doing harvesting your soybeans and you intend to plant wheat afterwards, uh, just be mindful of those rotational uh, restrictions, okay? These are the, the three main things that have come up multiple times uh, this past uh, few days here. And then finally, uh, one thing that I want to say, because we're going to be discussing a lot of cover crop today, uh, we've been having these discussions internally, and then we also got to ask uh, by our stakeholders um, whether there is kind of an agenda being pushed out there. And all we want to say is all the, the work that we've been doing with cover crop is because there is a lot of interest out there from our growers. Uh, we do have a lot of problems with resistant weeds out there, as you all know. And through some of the work that we're doing here, we're learning that if we're planting a cover crop and if we're managing that cover crop properly, uh, it brings a lot of uh, you know, benefits for our soils and so on, but it can really help uh, with weed management. So I just wanted to share that out there because that has come up uh, a few times this past uh, weeks, okay? So with that, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. As you realize, my voice is not doing very well today, so I'm gonna try my best. Hopefully you can understand what I'm saying, uh, but I'm glad that Nick is gonna be presenting here today and Jose is gonna take up uh, a good amount of our time. So just gonna start sharing this. Uh, screen number two. Hope you all can see this. And with that, I'm gonna pass it on uh, to Nick. Thanks, Rodrigo, folks. Thanks for having me. Um, I don't know if he'll admit it, but the rumor is Rodrigo lost his voice screaming at the TV the other night when Jimmy Butler dropped a 50-piece on the Milwaukee Bucks. So uh, we're all rooting for uh, that so we can get Rodrigo's voice back because uh, uh, our grad students need uh, some verbal lashing sometimes during the season, so we're going to need his energy. <laughs> Um, you know, we're going to talk cover crop, we're going to talk early season weed control, and we're going to talk about it in the corn and soybean system. So I'll just ask if anybody's got their mute, if they could just mute, please. Uh, I want to talk about, first and foremost, of course, all the people that support our research, uh, being the agronomists in the state, the university extension, all the all the funding agencies, the commodity groups, and, you know, when I say that, that's corn and soybean farmers. So you guys support us. So we appreciate you guiding us in our mission. And then of course, the students and staff of uh, years past and all the work that they've done. So we're gonna talk about cover crops. I'm not gonna talk too much about it, but Jose is really gonna carry the load here today. And then Rodrigo is gonna talk more about how to control the weeds you have in your field and making sure that cover crop doesn't turn into a weed. So we're sitting here where most, most of us are anxious to get in the field, maybe, uh, We've gotten some things planted. I just want to start out and say, let's just make sure the planter doesn't get too far ahead of the sprayer because uh, opportunities like this, we get excited, we plant a lot, and then we have to get back and get our residuals on. We don't start clean. It's a heck of a lot harder to stay clean. That's going to become from effective tillage, burn down, so, uh, and reliance on residuals. So first and foremost, we want to talk about our two major weeds that drive most of the management decisions of our corn and soybean acres and that's water hemp giant ragweed. <clears throat> if you're looking at your field right now, you've been out there this last week, if you got giant ragweed in there, it's probably growing already, and it's probably about halfway to four inches, okay? So we're talking about controlling giant ragweed. We need to be thinking about uh, an effective burn down or tillage uh, as, soon as, as soon as possible before we get too far ahead with our planter. Uh, water hemp is another story. It's coming up a little later in the season. I'm just gonna use a couple of tweets from the last two years. This one, a couple of weeks ago, April 13th, we already got giant ragweed coming up out of the ground. Uh, props to Josh Camps for sending the picture. And look at those hands. He's got dirt under his finger. Out. You know Josh is getting work done. Now we take a look at water hemp. We still got a few weeks until water hemp comes up. This is a tweet from last year. Rodrigo taking a picture from Rock County Farm. Probably May 17th, May 15th, May 17th. A little later than that is when we're going to start seeing water hemp emerge. So when you're thinking about looking at the data that we provided on how to control these weeds, if you have both in your field, 
you need to be thinking about controlling that giant ragweed now, but you need to be thinking about controlling that water hemp a little bit later. So how is that going to fit in your field, if, especially if you're trying to run out the gate and get those beans in the ground as soon as you can? So just a reminder from whole uh, scary is silly and maybe motivate you to think about non-chemical approaches to weed management. Here's a, just your uh, you know, bi-weekly reminder here of the water hemp's ability to evolve resistance to herbicides, right? So this is work our grad student Felipe Faleco has done over the years. Taking a look at this picture, this is a water hemp that is just uh, a brutal infestation. And we have the list of the herbicides and the group numbers that we use. And as you see, most of the herbicides we're using for post-emergence in corn or soybeans, we've already documented resistance to. A uh, particular scary thing is you might remember if you've seen this slide before is this is one population from Brooklyn, Wisconsin. So we have this resistance. Most of this resistance is widespread, but you need to understand if you have resistance in your field, and this is also just a continued motivation to be thinking about non-chemical approaches. You know, finally, we think about what options we have and sort of our more novel herbicides are uh, our newly used herbicide transgenic traits in our soybeans that are allowing us to use these herbicides, how much longer until we put glufosinate on this list or Liberty, right? We're going to put a lot of pressure on Liberty. We've been putting a lot of pressure on the last few years. How much more time do we have until any of these herbicides are really effective from a post-emergent standpoint? So when we talk about resistance, we're usually talking about post-emergent herbicides. We tend to lean on the recommendation of using residuals. So when I talk about residuals, talking about a pre-emergent herbicide that you would pair with an effective burn down, and then a herbicide that you would pair with your post-emergent with residual. Now, the unfortunate thing is that we've also documented resistance to PPO pre-emergent herbicides in water hemp. So this is a population from, I believe, Dodge County. And this is, uh, you know, it's one of those things where I can't say that we're terribly surprised to find it. Uh, we are just uh, upset for how quick, I guess, we've identified this in the last year. And uh, Felipe is continuing to test this population for additional PPO pre-emergent herbicides. So Rodrigo is going to touch on this later, but when you think about foundation pre's for water hunt control, PPOs are always coming up to the top. So we're talking about your Spartan or Sulfentrazone, your authority products or your Flumioxazin, so your Valor or your Fierce products. Those are something that we need to be paying attention to. And it's particularly concerning because a lot of times we come here and we talk about resistance, some of the more novel cases of resistance, we're talking about states to the south of us. Unfortunately, we're already finding this in Wisconsin. So this is something we need to be thinking about. On top of that, talking about a state to the south of us, Work done by Dr. Aaron Hager over the years and Dr. Pat Trano there is they've identified group 15 resistance. So if you look at some of the water hemp resources we've released over the years, you know, we say pick a pre-emergent herbicide that has effective sites of action, which would likely be a, either a group 14, the PPO, a group 15, your LCFA. So this is your, as Rodrigo was talking about, your warrant, your uh, dual magnum your proxisulfone, that Zidua, these are the new, this class of herbicides we rely really heavily on for small seeded weed control. We already have documented that group 15 resistance in the state of Illinois. So instead of just thinking that you need to adopt an aggressive pre-emergent herbicide program, we need to be cognizant of that ability to adapt resistance to pre's. So when we have resistance to posts, we spray the herbicide, to the plant, the plant doesn't die, right? What does resistance to pre's look like? You spray the pre, the pre typically lasts about 30 days in the soil, you get nice control for about 30 days. When you start to see resistance in your field, you're gonna see that narrow, a window of residual control narrow. So you're still gonna see some control, but you're gonna see this more escapes and you're gonna see more escapes faster. So the reason we included these slides up front is just to show where we've, We've been going with our chemical weed management program in corn and soybeans and why we're shifting towards this conversation about bringing in non-chemical control and bringing in a cereal rye cover crop uh, 
as the data that Jose is going to share with us today as part of his PhD. So this is work done by uh, one of my good friends, former grad student Colby Grant. Uh, this is just looking at growing degree days over the years of a fall seeded and a fall seeded cereal rye and the accumulation of biomass. Uh, you don't need to pay much attention to this data, really. All it really shows is that the longer we can wait, the longer we can allow that cereal rye to grow, the higher amount of that biomass. And this is in corn and soybean fields. And this is data from Arlington and Lancaster over three years. Now, Jose's work is going to show that if we want to get the biomass we need for weed control, we're going to delay termination towards the time of planting or even after the time of soybean planting. So we want to talk a little bit about termination, cereal rye termination. So uh, our major recommendation for cereal rye termination is the use of glyphosate. So Roundup, Roundup Power Max 3 is probably what's most available out there right now. Uh, any non, uh, non uh, any generic version of glyphosate would do. Major recommendations for us if you're terminating a cereal rye cover crop and you're using glyphosate is that you need, you want to have day temperatures that are above 55 degrees Fahrenheit and night temperatures above 40 degrees. General recommendation is two to three nights ahead of the termination and two to three nights after the termination at those temperatures. Now, to be fair, Jose and I are going to go to the field tomorrow. We're going to terminate some rye and wheat. We are really straddling that line right now. We're getting colder. So we understand that when the situation we have right now, just, just the sun shining in here right now just makes me anxious to put some beans in the ground. So we want to be thinking about our termination of rye. So it's kind of one of those do as I say, not as I do, but also fit it into your system that works, right? If you gotta go and it's been a little cold ahead of that termination, just make sure you're going a full label rate and you're including uh, your adjuvants so that you make sure you get an effective kill, all right? So what happens if you've got weeds sitting in that field, especially ones that are glyphosate resistant? The general recommendation would be to bring in uh, a synthetic oxen such as 2,4-D or another burner, uh, burn down herbicide like Sharpen, like group 14. Add that into your glyphosate tank mix and you should get an effective termination of your cover crop while also controlling the weeds that are standing so that you can establish your crop into a clean field. I'm not going to touch in, in, in length here because a lot of times we come into a room, we talk cover crops, but really when we say cover crops, we're talking cereal rye. I just want to point to a resource that our buddy Dan Smith and his colleagues put together over the years, and this is about cover crop termination. You can find this cover crops 101 from UW-Madison, the NPM program. All that information you need if you're trying to kill other, other cover crops are going to be in there, but it's pretty much going to be pretty similar. Label rate of glyphosate and then bringing in a growth regulator on some of these additional weeds. All right. So that is a resource I'd like you to chase down on your own if you're looking at terminating other cover crops. Finally, I just want to talk a little bit about some data we've collected over the past two years. This is research led by our master's student, Jacob Felsman. And this is looking at terminating cereal rye ahead of soybeans at the time of soybean planting, looking at glyphosate, but also comparing it to other grass herbicides like our group ones, our clethodin pozolifops. So this is like our select or sure, our, our uh, ACCAs herbicides. Uh, Jacob's work is showing us that glyphosate is still king when it comes to terminating our cereal rye. We also brought in the roller crimper. Roller crimper is important. I'm going to touch on this just in a second, but it's all about timing there in terms of effective control. In general, we would not recommend adopting a group one herbicide for burning down your cereal rye. It is slow moving. The plants remain green. They remain standing, and it really puts a stress on your soybean crop if you're not getting an effective kill, and especially if we have a dry spring, this is really something we would be concerned about. If you take that same data and kind of overlay it with yield, and I apologize, we don't have bushels per acre here, but the general, the trend is the same. Our glyphosate's keeping us closest to our yield of a pre-plant termination of cereal rye. So in effect, I like to think of this pre-plant as not even having a cereal rye, because by the time we're planting soybeans, that rye has melted away and disappeared. So you're seeing when we're using our glyphosate, we're getting similar yields, bringing in the rollers can reduce our yields if we're not getting an effective kill and we're having some competition there. 
And if we're really, the key here is a cover crop is really not gonna be a benefit to you if it's taking away from your cash crop. And a lot of that is gonna do with effective termination, effective crop establishment, and minimizing the competition for resource. Just, just to talk roller crimper right here, here is me just standing in front of one of my favorite mistakes we've ever made. And this is, we went in and we tried to crimp our rye a little early. This picture's from Dan. This is what your rye should look like if you're relying on a roller crimper or mechanical termination of your rye. If you're not shedding pollen from that field, you're probably not gonna kill your rye. And we found that you're gonna have to roll it multiple times and that's just not an efficient process. You can see one of Jose's projects from years ago. We, we, we didn't terminate our rye completely. It, it came back with the roller crimper. It set seed and it laid exactly to the, to the plot edges. A, we seeded ourselves a rye for the next year. So all the resources I just shared with you, a lot of what Jose is gonna share with you is available on our website, on some of our resources. This is something that Colby led a couple of years ago. A lot of the information stands true today. Scan that QR code, check out our website, whiskweeds.info for more information on considering when you cover crop, your, terminate your cover crop. Finally, I've got just a resource. A lot of Jose's work is the backbone of this. It's something we put together online. In case uh, you want to dive deeper into the data that we share with you today. And lastly, I just want to say, don't be afraid to pay attention to what's going on in the rest of the country, right? Places warm up a little faster than us. Uh, it's in, we sort of have the benefit of being a little slower moving here up in the northern latitude that we can see what's going on in the other states and learn from uh, some of the things that are going on. Our colleagues in Penn State right now are saying, Maybe we shouldn't plant green. You know, they're looking at a soil moisture deficit. They're looking at a potentially dry spring. And they're saying, if we're going into a dry spring with a soil moisture deficit, this Sierra rye is not going to do us any good for what we want. You know, the key here is a good crop first and then a good cover crop second, right? So keep an eye on the weather. Feel free to chase this link. Um, it's not necessarily translatable to Wisconsin as we see it right now but it's always important to pay attention to what's going on around us because what, uh, what Pennsylvania sees this year might be what we see next year or what we might see if we don't uh, catch some good moisture here in the next few weeks. So with that, I'm gonna invite Jose to come over here and talk. I think Jose will cover our cover crops. Maybe we'll hold till Jose finishes and we'll look at any conversation, discussion, questions we have about cover crops before we transition to Jose. So thanks for the opportunity. Good luck this evening. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're all doing well. Uh, as Nick introduced me, my name is Jose Nunes. I'm one of Rodrigo's PhD students, and I've been working with Sierra cover crop for water hemp suppression and soybeans. And today, my goal here is to provide you some considerations about the, the importance of Sierra cover crop termination for effective uh, water hemp suppression, uh, the impacts of the Sierra cover crop on the fate of pre emerged herbicides, and also a little bit about soybean yield at the end of the season. So before I start this presentation, I just wanted to say that you know, when we talk about cover crops, uh, it's, cover crops are not a silver bullet, so they're not going to solve all your weeds problems. Uh, so it's very really unlikely that they're going to provide season-long weed control. So when we, when we talk about cover crops, uh, this is more like another tool that farmers can integrate their toolbox to help them uh, manage problematic weed species. So we don't want them to replace a herbicide with cover crops. We want them to integrate this practice because it, it has a lot of different benefits. So I've been working with water hemp in my research projects. And as most of you know, water hemp is a really uh, big problem in the state of Wisconsin. So this is a map from my colleague, Felipe Faleco, showing that uh, herbicide resistance, water hemp herbicide resistance uh, is widespread across the state of Wisconsin. So do that those cases of resistance, especially to post emerge herbicide resistance. That's why I've been working with cover crops, uh, with CRI to give farmers another option uh, to help manage water hemp. So water hemp is going to be the topic, the focus of my presentation today. And as Nick introduced, uh, the idea of the CRI cover crop. So here we want to have uh, a desired plant. 
growing between the two growing seasons when we have a corn soybean rotation or a continuous soybean system. So we wanna have that ground covered uh, with a desired plant instead of being sitting there as a fallow. Uh, in the case of the cereal cover crop, it has two ways uh, to provide weed suppression. The first one is by competing with weeds uh, for resource and space. It's, this is especially true for, the, for weeds that emerge uh, either uh, late in the fall or really early in the spring. Uh, but for water hemp suppression, uh, we don't, in most of the cases, we don't have a direct competition of the cereal cover crop with the water hemp plants because at times the water hemp start to germinate. Uh, we, most of the cases we have already terminated that cereal cover crop. So for water hemp suppression, the key here is to produce enough biomass. We must have enough biomass to have this mulch uh, protecting the soil, which is going to prevent water hemp emergence and also do, uh, delay its development. So the key here for when we talk about CRI cover crop for water hemp suppression is biomass accumulation. And in the state of Wisconsin, in the upper Midwest in general, uh, heat accumulation is a big challenge for CRI growth. So we must extend that window for cover crop growth as much as we can. So CRI termination is really important in this system. And one common question that we have about the system is, when do you terminate that CRI? So some farmers, they follow this kind of standard recommendation of terminating the CRI uh, one to two weeks before soybean planting or before cash crop planting. We call this an early termination. And they do this trying to avoid any kind of issues with crop establishment or cash crop yield at the end of the season. Uh, the problem when we do this practice of terminating the CRI uh, early in the season before cash crop planting is that in most cases we don't have yet enough biomass to provide uh, effective water hemp suppression. And then if we postpone that CRI termination uh, and we still wanna do that termination before soybean planting, we're also gonna delay soybean planting. And we know that from a yield stand perspective, uh, delaying soybean planting is not a good recommendation. So one way to go around this is the use of the planting green system. In this system, instead of, in this recommendation, instead of terminating the CRI uh, one to two weeks before soybean planting, we terminate it at soybean planting or even after in some cases. So instead of uh, delaying the soybean planting, we're only going to change the CRI termination timing so we can increase and maximize that window uh, for cover crop growth. So when it comes to cover cropping, biomass accumulation, CRI is one of the best options that we have. And that's because CRI responds to growth quite well in the spring. So those pictures are from last year in the month of April. So April 15 and April 29, so about two weeks apart. And as you can see, there's a good difference in biomass accumulation during the month of April, which was uh, quite cold last year. So if you give the CRI an extra 10 days, an extra week to grow in the month, during the month of May, it's going to accumulate a lot more biomass. Uh, Nick touched on this. So the two main ways we have to terminate the CRI is the use of herbicides. Glyphosate is our best option. And the second option, the second uh, method to terminate the CRI cover crop is the use of a roller, a mechanical termination. Uh, both methods, they have their pros and cons, and I'll be happy to, any, to ha answer uh, any questions might have about the difference between the two terminations uh, based on what we learned during the past few years. So as I said, the planting green uh, system, this recommendation of delaying CRI termination until soybean planting, uh, it's kind of a new recommendation. So we have a lot of questions about this new system. So we developed, we uh, conducted this study, this multi-state study uh, over the past two growing seasons uh, in several locations across the US, trying to understand what are the impacts uh, of this practice uh, on water hemp suppression, also soybean yield. So for this study, this is a multi-state project. So we had a standard protocol that was conducted across several locations and we compare a uh, different CRI management practice. So we had, so had no-till, so no cover crop, soybean after corn, uh, and also the two termination timings for the CRI cover crop. The early termination, so before soybean planting, about 11 days before soybean planting, and the planting green system, when we terminate the rye at soybean planting, both with glyphosate as a chemical termination. Uh, we also had the use of a pre-herbicide as a factor of this study. Uh, we know that pre, a, pre, a residual herbicide is really important for water hemp management. 
Uh, and the third and final factor of this study was soybean planting. We had two soybean planting times in early or standard because it was the earliest possible date for soybean planting in each location uh, and delayed, which was about two weeks after that. And some of the data that we'll be presenting today is going to be the CRI biomass, water hemp density, and also soybean yield. So I'd like to start with the CRI biomass at the time of termination of dry. Uh, so on this plot here on the bottom, the X axis, uh, we have our two CRI termination timings. Uh, the early termination, which was before soybean planting, and the planting green system when we terminate the rye uh, at soybean planting. Uh, this left face, this is the early soybean planting time, and the right face is the late soybean planting time. And then we have bushes per acre for CRI biomass. So as you can see on this plot, when we delay the CRI termination, there's a good increase uh, in biomass accumulation, either by delaying the termination itself or by delaying the soybean planting time. Uh, I also might notice on this plot, I have this red line indicating the level of 4,500 pounds per acre of CRI cover crop biomass. I highlight this number because we have uh, data in the literature and also some of our data support uh, this assumption that with for around 4,500 pounds per acre of dry uh, cover crop biomass, we can have effective weed suppression. So I wanted to highlight that we managed to accumulate this level of biomass uh, without changing soybean planting time, without postponing soybean planting time, only by adjusting the CRI termination time, only by using the planting green. When we terminate the right too early, we didn't accumulate this amount of biomass that can provide us effective with suppression, but when we delay until soybean planting, uh, we managed to accumulate this amount of biomass. Uh, this is an average of several locations, and then you might wonder, but we're in Wisconsin, so why are you showing us data from different locations? The thing is, uh, we had like extreme levels of biomass, uh, extreme lows and extreme highs. So this is a good average from different conditions. Uh, over the two years that we conducted this study in Wisconsin, we had a really good establishment of the CRI and we accumulate a lot of more biomass than this. So what we didn't think the condition that we had in Wisconsin was realis realistic for most farmers. So overall, this is a good average for this system. And here's the data that support that assumptions, that assumption that with around 4,500 pounds per acre of dry biomass, we can have effective water hemp suppression. So on the x-axis on the bottom, we have the CRI biomass in pounds per acre. Uh, and the y-axis, we have water hemp density at the time of post-emerge herbicide application without or with the use of a pre-herbicide. So as you can see, when we increase, at CRI biomass, there is a decrease in water hemp density. And as we move past 4,500 pounds per acre of dry biomass, there's a good reduction in water hemp density. So this is the first message that I have for you from this presentation, that delaying CRI termination to soybean planting or planting green uh, can increase biomass accumulation so it can achieve the level of 4,500 pounds per acre of dry CRI biomass for potential effective water hemp suppression. Of course, this effective suppression is going to depend on a lot of different conditions, but overall, with this amount of biomass, we've had success uh, in this system for water hemp suppression. And I also like to emphasize once again, we managed to accumulate this amount of biomass without changing soybean planting time, only by just the termination of the rye. So at the beginning of my presentation, I said that sometimes we terminate the rye too early, and so we don't have enough biomass for effective water hemp suppression. I have some pictures here to show you uh, with image what I mean by that. So I took this picture last year on May 21st, so 10 days after soybean planting. Uh, this strip of rye uh, on, the, on, the left, on the right, uh, it was the rye that we terminated before soybean planting, so it was our early termination. It was terminated 11 days uh, before soybean planting, so end of April. And then on the left, we have the CRI that we terminated uh, at soybean planting, the planting green system. So as you can see up front, there's a good difference in biomass accumulation just by delaying that termination by 11 days. And then we move on to about a month after. So June 14, uh, we can see the beans are larger and also we can see the water hemp pressure is quite high, quite high at this location. There's a good amount of plants coming. And at this location, the water hemp start to germinate about mid-May, late May. Uh, and this picture is from the early termination of the rye. So besides the water hemp, you also can see that most of the CRI cover crop biomass has already gone. 
it has already decomposed in that early termination. So this is a good example of the importance of the CRI termination for effective water hemp suppression. So what happened here, we terminated that rye late April. So the CN ratio of that biomass was still low. So the decomposition process took right, it started right away. Uh, and the biomass decomposition is quite fast. The rate of the decomposition was quite fast in this situation. So by the time that the water hemp started to germinate, there's no, there's no longer enough biomass to provide uh, effective water hemp suppression. So when we look at the water hemp density uh, under these conditions, so with the planting green, we had about 50 plants per square meter, square meter 50 water hemp plants. Uh, and for the early termination, we had almost 200 plants uh, per square meter. And as I said at the beginning of my presentation, you know, the, the cover crops are not going to solve all your problems. They're not a silver bullet. So even with the planting green system, with about 6,000 pounds per acre of dry cereal biomass, we still had about 50 water hemp plants per square meter. So one way that farmers can improve that early season water hemp control is to adopt is to integrate also uh, a pre-emerged herbicide into their weed management program. So one of the concerns that we have when we talk about the use of a pre-herbicide with the CRI cover crop is going to be the fate of that product in the environment, especially regarding the interception of that pre because of that CRI cover crop biomass. So here you have two different situations, the conventional tillage and the cover crop side by side, the CRI side by side, and we're spraying a pre. So when we spray a pre, we want that product to go to the soil to have a fit effect of residual weed control. But when we have that cover crop, we know that it's going to be a little bit of interception from that biomass. So when we talk about herbicide fate, it's the, the, the all the process that can affect uh, what's going to happen with that product, with that product once it leaves the, the sprayer boom. So in the case of a pre-emerged herbicide, we want to spray that product so it goes straight to the soil, so it reaches the soil solution, so it can provide a residual weed control. Uh, we, we should know that uh, a residual a pre emerged herbicide is not going to provide effective weed control from the cover crop biomass. It must go to the soil at some point. So when we have that cover crop biomass, there is going to be interception of that product. Uh, you must, and then we're going to rely on rainfall after the application to move that product to the soil solution so it can provide residual weed control. So this was one of the first studies that we did. Uh, on this subject, you know, trying to understand what are the impacts uh, of the CRI cover crop on pre-herbicide uh, spray deposition and fate in the environment. So we compared four different systems. We had the no-till, soybean after soybean, uh, and conventional tillage as our standard practice, and also two uh, different ways to terminate that rye. The roller, the mechanical termination, where we had this mat of CRI cover crop biomass, and the glyphosate, the chemical termination, where we had a standing CRI cover crop biomass. So one of our goals here was to evaluate uh, the spray deposition when we spray the prees. So what we did here, we put water sensitive parts at the soil level below that biomass to simulate the interception of that pre-herbicide uh, during the application. And then we analyzed those cars to see what was the spray covered uh, from this study. So this is what we learned about uh, spray deposition so here I have an example of four different or four different cards from all those treatments, uh, and the plot here on the right uh, we have uh, the different treatments: the tillage, the no-till, and the two CRI treatments, glyphosate and roller. And on the y-axis we have the percent of spray coverage, uh, which was the percent of the card that was covered by droplets. So with the tillage we had the highest spray coverage. That's because we didn't have anything intercepting. Uh, spray solution because we work the ground. Uh, the no-till resulted in a little bit of uh, reduction in spray coverage because we still had a little bit of stubble from the previous growing season. Uh, but the main difference here is when we have that CRI cover crop, there's a good reduction in the amount of droplets that made contact with the soil at pre-application. So this was what we observed at the time of application. And then we went back to the field 25 days after treatment and then we collect soil samples to analyze the concentration of metolachlor and sufentrazone, which was uh, the two prees that we sprayed. Uh, the trends here from those plots uh, in the concentration of the herbicide in the soil 25 days after treatment uh, is quite similar to the spray deposition data. Uh, as you can see here, we have the same layout of plots 
And the main reduction happens when we have the cover crop biomass. And what happened here when we sprayed those sprays, uh, that biomass, the presence of the biomass intercepted a good amount of that spray solution. So it prevents those products from reaching the soil. And even with 25 days after treatment with rainfall after application, we didn't manage to move all that herbicide from the biomass to the soil. So even with rainfall, uh, with time, a little bit of that product was lost because of that interception during application. Uh, we conducted a different study, second study on this subject uh, with different products, with fulmioxazine and paroxysulfone. And for, with this study, uh, we collect the soil samples to analyze their concentration of the soil at different timings after application. So we collect soil samples at zero, seven, and 21 days after treatment. Uh, the red line, this is no-till, soybean after corn. Uh, so we have corn residue, corn stubble in this no-till treatment. Uh, the blue line is the, the cereal terminated before soybean planting, about 11 days before uh, soybean planting. And the green bar is the planting green system when we terminate the rye at soybean planting. So as you can see here, when we decrease, uh, as we go by, uh, there is a decrease in the concentration of both products uh, in the soil over time. But then when we look at the beginning of the study at zero here, when we spray, there's a difference between the no-till and the two termination timings. There's a gap here. And this is because of that interception that we observe when we have the cover crop biomass. And then when you go to 21 days after treatment at the final sampling time, uh, we can see that for fumioxazine, no-till and the cover crop treatments, they're quite similar. They're quite, the concentration of the soil fumioxazine uh, is quite similar between the no-till and the cover crop treatments. But for paroxysal we found there is a, still a gap between the no-till and the cover crop treatments. So we can see that for different products, they have different behaviors uh, in the soil when we have the cover crop, the presence of the cover crop biomass. So we're not uh, emphasizing they use this product or that product, but we just wanna show that there are different uh, in pre-emerge herbicide options when it comes to the fate in the environment. So over those studies, you know, we had different conditions, different levels of cover crop biomass when we spray those trees. Uh, and what we learned was that as we increase the cover crop biomass accumulation, there is more ground cover. So there's also uh, more interception uh, of that pre. So the more biomass you have, the more interception and the lower is gonna be the concentration of that pre in the soil because of that biomass. So one common question about this system is when we say that we're gonna have a lower concentration of those products in the soil, farmers always ask, what about the, the residual weed control is gonna be affected as well? So when we look at this plot here, we have water hemp dense at the time of post application. So we have our different systems, no-till, uh, CRI early terminated and planting green. Uh, and we have water hemp dense on the y-axis without the use of a pre or with the use of a pre herbicide. If we focus here, when we had the pre herbicide, we had the combination of the cover crop and the pre herbicide, we can see there is no difference across treatments. So the cover, even though there is a reduction in the concentration of the pre uh, in the soil, it's not affecting residual weed control because here we have the combination of the, the weed suppression from the cover crop and also the residual weed control from that herbicide. So this is the second message I have from this presentation. So the CRI cover crop intercepts that pre herbicide during application, but has not shown to negative affect uh, the water hemp residual control. Again, because we have a combination of the residual weed control from the herbicide with the weed suppression uh, from the cover crop. Uh, the final part of my presentation is going to be soybean yield. So here I have two different conditions uh, of soybean yield that I'm going to show you. So just so, so I can explain the layout of the plot, it's quite similar to the uh, water hemp density plots. We have no-till, early termination for the CRI before soybean planting, and the planting green when you terminate the rye at soybean planting. We have the early soybean planting and the late soybean planting time, and we have bush spray acre for yield. We can see in this plot, there's no difference in soybean yield across treatments, regardless of the soybean planting time. But on the second condition that I'm gonna show you now, we can see that the planting green system reduced soybean yield compared to no-till and the early termination, especially in the late soybean planting time when we had that increase in biomass accumulation. So you must be wondering what is the difference between those two different situations. 
When we look at the soybean stand at the end of the season for this condition where there was no difference in yield, we can see there's also no difference in soybean stand. So the soybean establishment here was successful. But on this condition, when we had the difference in yield, we can see that the soybean stand matches uh, the soybean yield result. So at the end of the season, there was a big difference in soybean population and soybean stand. So the, the key here uh, of this system is to have a successful establishment of the soybean crop. So the final message from this presentation is the cereal cover crop accumulation is the key to effective water ham suppression. We need that biomass uh, to have effective weed suppression. The challenge is to find that balance that I just mentioned uh, between weed suppression and successful, successful crop establishment to prevent yield reduction. So I'm not saying that the cover crop biomass is the only reason to have a difference in standing, to have a challenging uh, soybean establishment, uh, but it is a good part of that system. You know, when we, some farmers, they're more prepared to plan through high residue scenarios. Some farmers, they don't have that experience. So especially if you're just starting with this practice now with cover cropping, if, especially with the planting meat system, I would advise you to keep an eye on the CRI growth. Uh, it can grow, really, it can develop really fast uh, early season, especially during the month of May. So scout the fields, uh, make sure you're prepared to plant that high residue scenario. Because as you can see here, if we, if we manage to have a successful establishment of the soybean crop, soybeans are resilient for this system, so we didn't observe any difference in yield. But in condition where there was a difference in establishment, this was, the establishment was unsuccessful, we can see there is a difference in soybean yield. And the final message just to close this presentation, you know, based on the results that we have uh, of the CRI cover crop for water ham suppression of soybeans, uh, we can say that the, the CRI cover crop can be part of an integrated weed management program uh, to help farmers ha manage water hemp in soybean. So there are different weeds in the landscape, different crops, so that's why we're still doing research with different weeds and different crops. But for water hemp and soybeans, uh, we can say that water hemp, the cereal cover crop can be a good option to manage uh, water hemp. So with that, I'm gonna pass along to Rodrigo. And if you have any questions, please ask them now. Um, we do have a couple in the chat box. Uh, if, I don't know if Rodrigo or Jose, I wanna, answer those uh, absolutely jerry yeah do you, do you mind reading them to us here sure uh so the first one going, so, yep. Yep. sure the first one is what is an average rye biomass yield for the early termination treatment yeah so for the early termination most of the time we're below that trash pool of 4500 pounds per acre of biomass usually we are around two to three thousand pounds Per acre of dry biomass, which is not enough for effective water hemp suppression, not just because of the level of the biomass, but also because that biomass is going to decompose really fast as soon as it's terminated. So by the time that the water hemp starts to germinate, we don't know, we no longer have that biomass to provide uh, water hemp suppression. And then uh, Josh camps had attended the uh, soybean plot or the Arlington field day last year, were any of those, and they checked the soybean plots out afterwards, were any of these plots from that tour that we were able to look at last year? Uh, the position, yeah, it's part of the presentation, not for soybean yield, but a part of the presentation is, but the soybean yield was not from those plots. Okay. And then uh, an, an additional question that came from a call-in um, attendee is, uh, can you comment on Mexico banning glyphosate uh, herbicides? Is that something that's happening or is, uh, this would be significant for US seed uh, pesticides and world export grain markets? Yeah, no, this is a good question. I'm not gonna expand on that one too much. Uh, I think this, this question has come up a couple of times. It's a, diff it's a similar scenario with, with what's happening in Europe. Is that going to impact? I don't know. So I don't want to expand too much on that today, Jerry. Okay. It's not directly related to this, but it's a fair question. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And then, then one more question that came in. Um, any comments on biomass termination at soybean planting versus after planting and any herbicide choices related to that? 
Yeah. yeah. So yeah, this is going to be our next step for this project is going to be to have not only termination at soybean plant, but also after soybean plant multiple times. So if you want to see what is the impact after soybean, not only at soybean planting. Uh, yeah, we're going to have some data that's pretty soon. Yep. So the, the current effort now, and those of you who end up attending our Brooklyn Field Day at the O'Brien Farms this summer, the new version of disaster project here is this uh, critical period of rye, uh, rye removal. So this is what we hope, the trial that we hope to plant tomorrow. So we're going to plant our soybeans early and we want to understand how long can we let the rye grow, okay, before we terminate it and not impact yield and get good water ham suppression. So that's one of the focal points of that study. But then addressing this question this is a phenomenal question because those of you who have attended Nick and I's talk, you know, most of the effective residual herbicides, they got to be sprayed within three days from planting. So that's a starting point of this conversation. So you got to look at what your plan is for a pre-emergent herbicide. And remember all those herbicides that contain flumioxazin, uh, okay, a valor-based program or uh, Spartan, so fentanyl based program, they got to be sprayed within three days of planting. Okay. So if you intend to plant green and let that rye continue to grow, you may have to revisit that program. And this is where the group 15 herbicides, your duos, your, your warrants, uh, your zidruas and outlooks out there combined with perhaps Fomazafen or Flexstar become your new option if you wanna plant and then deliver the residual herbicide later on. This is also part of our uh, research efforts trying to understand that exact uh, question. Okay, if I'm changing things a little bit, if I'm gonna plant green and early, I wanna let my rye grow and I wanna deliver my residual later on, what are my options? And this is kind of what we're working on. So I hope that addresses that question, Jerry. Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, then another question, is there comparable research being done on cover crops prior to a corn crop planting? Yeah, no, this is this is an excellent question. Uh, we started uh, doing some of that work. Uh, with corn is a little more, it's more of a finicky system, if you would. Uh, every time we let this rye, provide excessive amounts of biomass like Giselle was describing ahead, you know, like you did ahead of soybeans here, we had tremendous impact on uh, corn yield. Okay, so corn is a little different system. There's a lot of nitrogen tie up that happens in there. Uh, but what we're learning is you can you can go green, but you cannot go green with corn when you have very advanced zero rye, because otherwise you're gonna have tremendous impact uh, on your yield potential. And then what we're learning is, you know, you got to be able to adjust the fertility program. And that this gets outside of our area of expertise. Remember, we're uh, weed scientists. But remember that zero rye is just scavenging all that, you know, those nutrients in soil, particularly nitrogen. So the recommendation, and this is what we're doing for our systems-based trial, when we're planting corn green and that rye is about a foot tall, what we're doing is we want to deliver. And the standard recommendation we're hearing out there, at least 40 pounds of nitrogen up front. Uh, so you minimize some of the impact of that rye can have on your corn yield potential. And if you're interested in seeing and learning more about that, uh, we have that going on in our systems-based trial. So the long story short, from a weed suppression standpoint, ahead of soybeans, high biomass tends not to be a problem, assuming you can do a good job planting your seeds, but with corn is a little more complicated. And then another one came in, uh, would you attribute any of the weed suppression to allelopathy or is it only from competition for nutrients and sunlight? That's a fantastic question. And I'll let Josette start answering it and we can talk a little more because we, yeah, Josette. Yeah, the allelopathy part of weed suppression is hard to understand, hard to measure. So most of our work shows that, you know, the level of biomass is more important than any potential effect of the allele bed, uh, because as we increase biomass, there is an increase, there is a response in weed suppression. Uh, even when we use that biomass or green biomass, there is that response. So we believe there is a little bit, a little bit effect, some chemical compounds being released from the cover crop, but it's just so hard to measure. So it's really hard to, to point only that so we believe that the level of biomass that goes over the soil, protecting the soil is more important uh, than the chemical compound that might be released. That's a fantastic answer. Just to add to, to that, one of just as project, what he does, he goes to Arlington and he chops biomass at Arlington. He lets that dry. And then he brings dry biomass, a seed or right cover crop to Brooklyn. 
and he puts different amounts of biomass in the soil surface. And what drives suppression is what he's saying is the amount of biomass you can accumulate. So a little petty might be playing a role here, uh, but the true driver for weed suppression is the amount of biomass you can accumulate having that barrier, that mulch on that soil surface, impeding that small seeded weed to establish and grow. Great. Um, I, th I think that's all the questions we got now. Did you have some final comments, Rodrigo? Otherwise I'll do a couple housekeeping things here to share some uh, QR codes and things like that. Yeah, no, this is excellent. I have, I had a few extra slides here, Jerry, to present, sure. but you know, for sake of time here, uh, I'm just going to kind of talk about them uh, briefly. So, you know, the, the theme for today, here today, uh, you know, this early season controls, you know, Nick talked about uh, temperature, you know, watching your temperatures out there when making applications. So you get, uh, you know, effective control. Remember, those plants have to be growing because otherwise, if you're spraying, you know, systemic herbicide and your plants are not growing, you're not going to get good control. So that's something to keep in mind. Does that describe the value? Uh, of the high amount of biomass, adjusting your strategies there for termination, for getting suppression. The, the other thing we've been talking a lot about is the rate of the herbicides. So before we start spraying our residual herbicides, you know, just make sure you're delivering the right rates, right? Because we're now detecting resistance to our pre-herbicides. And one way to select for resistance to pre-herbicides is to apply low rates, right? So if you're exposing our weeds to low rates, this is how resistance evolves. And we've been using metribuzin this year as a case study uh, so we can reflect. So a lot of our growers are using, or agronomists, you know, they're using four to six ounces of metribuzin. And that rate is a good rate for weed burn down, but that's a weak rate for residual control. So just pay attention to those rates, go back to those labels. And then the other piece, the final piece is at the weed control in corn, right? We have a lot of excellent herbicides uh, the work at, that our former PhD student just completed, Tatiana Severo, what she has shown is that, you know, the combination of multiple active ingredients is key for extended residual weed control. And then we're talking about mixing multiple AIs, we're thinking about resistance management. But what we're learning from her work, that it's just, it's more than that, okay? When you're putting residual herbicides in the soil and you are using mixes uh, out there, Jose had that figure showing what happens with, with those herbicides. Some years were dry in the spring. Some years were really wet. Having two or three AIs together kind of compensate for that, okay? Some herbicides need more rainfall or water for activation and to stay active in the soil. Some herbicides need less. Therefore, the strategy of having two, three AIs together, you kind of protect yourself in case you have a dry year versus you have a wet year. So that was going to be the final remarks here of my presentation, Jerry. So with that, we can either take questions or we can pass it back uh, to you for the final remarks here of today's. And I just want to thank everybody for being here with us. It's such a beautiful day. And thanks, Nick and Joseph. Yeah, I don't think we have any uh, final questions. If they do come in, uh, we can uh, answer them as, as they go. But uh, just as a final uh, reminder, we do have CCAs for today. There was one credit in integrated pest management. So the QR code is on the screen. So you can scan that. Uh, also, I believe Sam or Steve will put the link in the chat box and you can uh, go directly to a form to scan there or put your number into that form and we'll collect it that way. If none of that's working, you can also put it in the chat box directly, put your CCA number there and we can collect it from, from that point uh, forward. So again, if you have uh, an ability to click on the link that's in the chat box or go into um, um, your uh, app and scan the, scan the QR code, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, just as a final reminder then for next time on the uh, Badger Crop Connect, we'll be back on May 10th. Uh, we will have Dr. Joe Lauer uh, talking about corn planting date and some of the risk management decision-making uh, from the corn planting side of things and how things are going. And then uh, we also have Dr. Uh, Ioana Newman from UW River Falls, who's also an extension forage specialist, uh, talking about some of the alfalfa stands and some of the snow cover effect on, on winter kill. So we hope you can uh, in, uh, be with us in a couple of weeks on May 10th, and uh, we will see you all then. I'll check the chat box one more time just to see if anything has come in.
Uh, doesn't look like there's anything there. So again, I want to thank uh, Rodrigo, uh, Nick, and Josiah for helping us out today. I uh, appreciate all the effort you put into uh, the information and appreciate this full hour of uh, weed management. It's definitely timely and we really appreciate the information. So uh, again, thanks everyone for attending and we will see you again on May 10th. Josh, you want to stop recording?